Welcome back to Switch to Linux. This is a special edition of Distro Wars because if you have been following the news or maybe you haven't been following the news, Windows 7 support is nearing end of life. That is means that your awesome Windows 7, one of the best operating systems Windows has ever done, is lying on its deathbed, taking its final breaths, just waiting for Microsoft to come in and snuff it out. That is right. And the question I have for you is, what are you going to do? Now, you can pay for extra support. You can continue to use it and risk whatever may or may not happen. You could do what they want you to do and have wanted you to do and buy a new computer or maybe attempt to get Windows 10 on your current system. Or why don't you just switch to Linux? So here on Distro Wars, if you're catching on to this and you've never seen one of these episodes because, hey, you follow Linux stuff and or you follow Windows stuff, not really Linux stuff, like what is this Linux stuff? I wanted to show you today why you might want to consider a switch to Linux. Now, what's going to happen here is uh, January 14th, so that's a couple days from when we're recording this. Windows 7 reaches end of life. That means that it's going to get its final security updates. No future security updates are going to be pushed, except for probably if there's some crazy worm, kind of like WannaCry, they'll probably patch something like that. But for the most part, you can assume your Windows 7 up, uh, will never get any more security updates unless you're paying for those those individual updates. All right, but then the next day, or maybe it's that day, you're gonna start seeing full screen nag screens about updating in Windows 7 reaching end of life. You do have the option to click the button to never be notified of this again, so you do have that option. But then if you continue to run Windows 7, you may or may not have some issues. It really does honestly depend on how risky of a computer user you are. If you're just playing a couple games and you're barely ever on the internet, you're probably still somewhat safe. If you're surfing the web a lot, you don't want to be doing that from a Windows 7 machine after its last security updates. So be aware of that, that these, uh, these changes are coming and you have to take some type of action. Now, what Microsoft would like you to do is they would like you to move to Windows 10. You can see, how do you prepare for this? From backing up files to finding a computer that fits your needs, we've got the tools. Check out your latest PCs, back up your files and photos, get tips on Windows 10. How about Fourth option, switch to Linux, people. And today on Distro Wars, we are going to show you Windows 10 versus Linux Mint. So let's go ahead and boot up a Windows machine. And this is going to take some time to boot up. So we'll boot up our Windows machine. We will kind of show you what Windows 10 is going to look like, how it's going to work, and, and all these types of fun things. So let's go ahead and uh, get started by looking at our Windows 10. Okay, so here we are on Windows 10. And the first thing that you will notice when you start up Windows 10 is the disk will like to sit there and spinning at 100% for a while. I believe what it's doing is it's gathering all of the things and uploading a bunch of stuff to Microsoft, but nobody quite knows exactly what's going on here to my knowledge. I have heard they may have fixed this in the 19 series. We are running this on 1803, although it is patched up to all security updates up to today. Um, I just could not get the updaters working. So literally I could not get the updates uh, systems working to have the latest version of Windows. Eventually I will get it running. We are running on 1.2 gigs of memory. Uh, we do have eight gigs available here. Uh, my Linux Mint machine is actually going to be running on six gigs, not eight. Just keep that in mind for comparisons if you're looking at the percent numbers and things. CPU is sitting here idling about three or four percent and I think the disk is done spinning around. So let's see what we can do here. So the things that I don't like in Windows, there's things that we cannot get rid of. So for example, if we go into our settings, we'll find things like the gaming bar. I'm not a gamer. I have zero interest in gaming. I'd like to just get rid of all this crap because it's eating up system memory and resources. I can't get rid of this stuff. I'm sorry. I won't be connecting an Xbox to your crap, nor will I be doing true play, nor game mode, nor broadcasting, nor game DVR, nor game bar. Give me the option to get rid of this crap. All right. 
but we don't. We also have Cortana. Oh, Cortana, the lovely spy who listens to everything that we are doing. Of course, I have turned some as much off as I can. This version of Windows is not activated. The good news is you can continue to use Windows that is not activated. The bad news is all of the telemetry is locked on the highest settings. So be aware of that. Oh, I can link my Android phone. I don't want to link my Android phone. Let's again delete some of this stuff so I have the option not to use it. You'll notice come the, the coloration there, how it looks gray and stuff. That's um, I think that's an artifact of my VirtualBox uh, graphic driver is not working well so you're not going to see that kind of stuff you'll see here it says windows isn't activated um i've not had any issues with this i boot this up when i need to look at something for a client in windows 10 so that's actually why internet explorer is here i have uh, at least one client that continues to use internet explorer don't ask me why so other things that i don't really like about it is there are multiple settings so let's see if i can actually get control panel working there we are we already saw the first settings panel but now there's a second settings panel isn't this exciting so now we have the old original control panel where some of the settings are here some of the settings are not and then we have our new settings panel so now we have to figure out where you are at at least in this version they gave us the ability to not have this thing full screen. And then there's actually now two places where you can uninstall applications. So if I can remember, I think under apps and features, there's a variety of applications that it likes to add that you can uninstall applications here, or you can actually still uninstall applications here. Not everything over in the list on our left is going to appear on our list on our right and vice versa. So like, look at this. I have this wonderful tips application. I'd like to just go ahead and uninstall tips. I really don't need tips. Um, there's Skype. I can uninstall Skype if I want. Oh, look, I can't uninstall sticky notes. Yay. I will never want to use sticky notes on this computer. I can't uninstall the voice recorder. Oh, I can uninstall the, the weather. That's good news. So basically, okay, and here, this kind of stuff. Okay, it looks like some of this I can uninstall, half of this stuff, all these green Xbox things. I can't uninstall them. I will never use them. I can uninstall Xbox Live. That's good news. So I can go ahead and uninstall that. That's helpful, but I really don't need anything else. And did the thing, at least the thing did not install Candy Crush again. I think I've uninstalled that thing like 15,000 times. Like Groove Music. I will never use Groove Music. Um, but, you know, these are those things that, that there's a lot of stuff that, uh, that I will never use and I can't get rid of. You will, again, notice that not everything is available from both places. So now this is going to lead to a little bit of confusion with multiple different settings panels and things like that. So as far as installing applications, we do have access to the Windows Microsoft Store. And uh, you can come over here into the store and you can download these applications. You can still grab things on the internet. Now there is a setting you can enable to disable the ability to install things from the internet, which is good and bad. Um, I've actually never, I gotta say, I have a confession, I've never actually used the Microsoft Store. Uh, how do you install something with this? Do I need an account or can I just push a button and install it? I have no idea. Let's go ahead and get. Um, no, I don't want to sign in with a Microsoft account. Okay, so it is actually installing applications. So you can go here into the store and you can download some trusted applications. Um, they are working on uh, they are working on getting um, let's go ahead and close that. No, just get rid stop. Stop. Go away. How do I get out of this thing? All right. I guess I clicked the back arrow, even though it was gray. All right, so you're not going to find everything that you need. Um, I think there's, I think there's uh, starting to do things like adding things like Photoshop on here. I don't think we have the full fledged Photoshop, right? We have Elements, Adobe Photoshop Express. There's a Practical Photoshop. None of these are the full application. Let's see if, for example, we have Dreamweaver. These are things that I might use in my. Uh, it does help if I spell Dreamweaver right, though. Uh, so simplified guides to Dreamweaver. So I can install applications there. I still need to get the external applications. Now, another major issue we have with Windows is if you're trying to install applications from the internet, you might actually get something that is 
bundled with something like bloatware. So I'm not sure if CCleaner still does this or not. I don't even know if I have CCleaner installed. Do I have CCleaner installed on you or not? I don't. Oh, wait, maybe I do. I don't know. Uh, so if we were actually to come over here, let's grab CCleaner directly from the, uh, the place where you grab it from. Let's go ahead and download this for free. Let's go ahead and run it from the, the bottom. It's running a security scan. Well, it's uh, downloading this and running the security and, uh, scan and installing the application. The next thing I'll tell you about is the updates in Windows. Of course, in Windows 10, you can now start to delay updates a little bit, but not a lot. And how many times I've come in, turned on the computer because I need to check on something for a client, and I found that I am completely unable to, uh, I'm completely unable to install, um, do what I wanted to do because the system says, oh, I need to update now. And I don't have any control. I can't say update later. I can't say delay update. It just uh, it just says, now I'm updating. Now, some of those are, are fixed in the more recent versions and things like that. Uh, let's see. Let's see if I run CCleaner. Let's see if this still bundles bloatware with it or not. So that actually just went ahead and ordered me somewhere. Did not look as though it wanted to install bloatware. That's good. Uh, some applications you grab from the internet do, some don't. And uh, let's just go ahead though and go into the control panel again. And oh, stop. I don't really want you activated, but okay. Let's just double, double check. So we have CCleaners installed. Oh, Google Chrome installed itself. It did not seem to bring anything else with it. That's actually good. CCleaner used to bring extra stuff with it. Uh, a lot of the applications, though, that are out there will bring bloatware with it, toolbars, things like that. Of course, uh, I hate these the uh, menu here. I find it to be extremely hard to use. I've always been that person where I've customized my menu where you pull up your start menu on Windows. You have four basic views. You know, I did programs. I did media. I did... Uh, system utilities, you know, whatever the last one was, games, I think it was. And then you pull this out and everything was nice and neat and organized. This is an abominable mess to me. And I can't control it. I can't say I want to go in and make some adjustments. Here's CCleaner. Uh, okay, look at that. I have the CCleaner homepage. Um, I can't even remove this crap. So now I'm left with this bloated, here's a link to CCleaner's homepage. I can't even get rid of it. What is this nonsense? I can't edit pretty much anything. We do have light themes and dark themes available in Windows now. That's good. But that's pretty much what you're going to get with Windows. So let's go ahead and jump over and have a look at Linux Mint now. And here we are on Linux Mint. Now, this is a custom theme. This is a theme that I built for a video. And uh, yeah, you guys will get this video soon as to how I built this theming. Uh, but now we are on Linux Mint. And I'm going to show you all these different things that... Uh just make this so much nicer. Now, first and foremost, we mentioned updates near the end. Well, actually, before we do that, let's go ahead into our system monitor. I want to have a look at this. Now, we are running a couple widgets here on the side. That might cause our RAM to go a little bit higher, but still our memory's at 890 megabytes. So we are running quite a bit more efficient than Windows. Notice that it is 14.9% of the RAM, but we only have 6 gigs of RAM in this instead of 7. Uh, we are idling. Our CPU is idling a little bit higher, but that's actually okay. That could actually be because of the, the widgets that I have over here. Um, updates. In Linux Mint, it will inform you that there are updates. You'll see this little guy down here at the bottom that says there are updates available, but it's never going to force you to install these updates. You can click this guy anytime you're ready and install the updates. You actually have the ability to come in and adjust your kernels. Let's go ahead and continue on there past our warning, see what kernel we're running. So we are running our uh, Linux 5 kernel in here. We can go up to 5.3 if we would like, but our updates are never going to force ourselves. Okay, now, other things inside of our menu, we have a nice favorites menu over here on the sidebar. We actually have a, um, 
just nice organization here. I can say, hey, here's my office applications. Here's these. But if I don't like something here, so maybe I come down here and I'm like, uh, let's see if there's anything that would apply. So programming. Okay, I only have one thing under programming. I don't mean to, I don't really want anything else there. I say, I just want to get rid of that whole thing. Let's just go ahead and throw that under office because I use it to work with anyway. Let's just right click the menu, configure it, and just go ahead and move it. I mean, really, why not? This is Linux. We can do whatever we want, right? So under our, let's go under our uh, programming. Here's Bluefish. Um, we can't just drag it, but what we can do is we can copy the item over here. Let's paste the item. Now we have a Bluefish editor up there in our menu. And then inside of our programming, let's just go ahead and hide those, turn off the checkbox. And that might be all we need to do. Oh, look at that. Now we have Bluefishes under our office and we now have no more program menu. Isn't that nice and painless? So you have the ability there to even edit our menus, even our picture down here. We can actually edit this picture as well. Uh, this is basically our, our menu item picture. We can go back to our original. You can put in your own individual one there if you want. Whatever you want it to be, you can go ahead and, uh, and have your own menus over there. As far as installing applications, we do have a software center that is not too uh, different than the Windows Store, except we have a lot more applications available. And those applications that we have available are more full featured. So for example, the application called GIMP, which is a, an acronym for the GNU Image Manipulator Program, this thing is available for free in the Software Center and it is every bit as powerful as Photoshop. So this guy here does the full, uh, full layers, full image scaling, full manipulation, everything that you might happen to need. Uh, I don't think we have Inkscape here, but you know something like Illustrator is duplicated inside of Inkscape. Are they exactly the same? They are not exactly the same. Uh, but will they accomplish your task without problems? Absolutely. They are new software, but you just go ahead, click this guy over here, click install, and you're up and running. Here's a nice picture of what the application is going to look like. We can grab information. This guy here is uh, is a good competitor to Illustrator. The only thing, in fact, I know of that Illustrator supports this doesn't is multiple canvases. We have a variety of different software. We can look into different Office suites, so our LibreOffice packages. There's uh, a variety of different text tools, just different things that you might happen to need on any given category. Of course, we were installing Spotify on Windows. Hey, you can go ahead and install Spotify over here on Linux as well. Just go ahead and grab it. It's going to tell you what it's going to install and download, and we just need to authenticate with our password. And we are set to go, and we are now installing Spotify. So over here, uh, if you want to change your theming styles, there are a variety of different themes. So it's for me, I really haven't liked this methodology lately where we're removing options. I understand it, but I don't really like it. I would love the option to be there to change this to the way my computer looks. Because I spend so much time on my computers, I really like to see my computers looking really nice, as I would define really nice. And for me, I like this really nice. Let me show you what Linux Mint, though, is going to look like out of the box when you first install it. You're going to have this theme, you're going to have uh, this theme, and you're going to have uh, this theme here. So this is actually what it's going to look like out of the box. All right, so this is uh, what we have. So it actually doesn't look too bad. It's very similar to Windows. The layout is practically the same. I actually added these three over here. I was doing some testing on that. But you can actually select a variety of different theming options yourself, or in my case, uh, what we were looking at when we first started is my own custom theme. I just created it. So, you know, you can quickly jump back and forth to all these different theme options, theme styles, and things like that. We also have access to a terminal. If that's your thing, you want to learn how to use a terminal, you can do that. Uh, all of the different features and functions available for a full-fledged operating system. By default, we're going to get Firefox. You can install Google Chrome if that's your thing. I'm not a big fan of it, but uh, for those that do want Google Chrome, you can actually just find it right there in the software store. You do not have to go onto the internet and download it. 
In fact, that's Google Earth. Let's see where Chrome happens to be. We might have to turn on a uh, repository for this one. Yeah, we might have to turn on a repository for this one. Uh, I thought we were, I thought Linux Mint had that. Some distros have it already set up, some distros don't. Um, so installing it uh, is not actually going to be a problem. So let's see, we have Thunderbird here for email, a full office suite, LibreOffice is um, every bit as good, if not in many ways better than Microsoft's Office version. So we have, uh, depending on your version as well, you'll have a variety of different options for layout. This particular version does not have your tab layout. I can actually put that onto the system without a real big deal. But out of the box, this guy has your ability to do office documents, your ability to manage and manipulate images, your control over the updates. And by the way, it booted in about a fraction of the time that Windows did. So what are the disadvantages? Well, your current existing Windows applications may not work, but most basic home users are simply accessing email, browsing the web, getting on social media, things like that. All of those features, perfectly adequate to do on Linux. There is no real things. Even for me, I do a lot of high-level production from book production, being an author, to website, website design. I do that on Linux, and it does everything that you need it to do. Now, if that's you and you're using specialized software, there's going to be new software to learn. But it's either learn new software or subject yourself to everything that Microsoft is doing and pushing upon you inside of Windows. So those are kind of our, our options and our ideas. So that is Linux Mint versus Windows 10. Which one of these guys happens to be better if you ask me? Well, let me tell you this. Linux, completely free to use, download, alter, change, adjust, and use freely for your applications. Absolutely, hands down, it is an amazing software. It has all the different tools and systems that we have and no spyware. It's not going to force us into updates. Those updates very well may break your computer. That's not just a Linux thing. That could happen in Linux, but that actually does happen in Windows quite a bit. How many people do I know that upgrade their computer automatically upgraded from Windows 7 to Windows 10 without their consent and wiped out files and applications, including Microsoft Office? So the people, the idea is they wanted some select people to buy a new version of Office. And so some computers wiped it out. I've actually had to work with some people who had that occur. I asked them what was the nature of their need to do documents. We decided to install LibreOffice on their win Windows computer instead. If you ask me, Linux is the better option. It's more customizable. It's, it's a lot nicer of a feel. I can set it up any way I want. To me, it's a much better, much cleaner operating system that I have more fundamental control over. Those are the reasons I'm going to suggest Linux Mint is going to be better than switching over to Windows 10 when your Windows 7 reaches end of life. Now I have an entire playlist of videos to teach you how to get started. You're kind of coming to the game a little late, but don't worry. Just because Windows has reached end of life does not mean you need to stop using Windows 7 on the 14th. You got some time, but take that Windows computer, start installing some of the free and open source software, Grab an extra USB drive, or if you have a second computer you can use, install Linux either on the USB drive so you can boot your computer off of Windows when you need it and off of the USB drive when you want to mess around on Linux, and then learn how to use the software, learn how to convert your workflow over. Those are important first steps that you can do to learn to get into the Linux world. So fear not, you do not have to go to Windows 10. If you're gonna learn something new anyway, you may as well learn Windows, or excuse me, whoa, don't learn Windows, bad, bad, bad. Learn Linux instead because you're gonna have more control over your system. So those are my thoughts. Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below.